Take your Bibles and turn with me to Daniel chapter 1. Thank you, Wallace. Daniel chapter 1. And in just a moment, we'll begin reading at verse 1. Today, I want to talk to you about something that uh, has been on my heart. And uh, in the year of 2020, I'm going to be preaching through on Sunday morning, starting next Sunday, the book of Revelation. I believe that the book of Revelation is one of the greatest books in the Bible. I don't believe anybody understands all of it except the Lord. But I do believe that promise that's given to us in the first chapter that we're blessed if we read it, if we hear it, and if we speak it. So I'm looking forward to that. And I guess the major message of the book of Revelation is a better day is coming. You know, ever since Adam and Eve ate of the forbidden fruit and sin came into the world and death through sin, the Bible says that all of us have been separated from God. And the only way we can come back and the only way we can see restored what God did when Adam sinned, Adam caused all of us to be separated from God. The sin of Adam has given every one of us the sinful nature that we all know that we have because we're so self-centered. We're so focused on what we want rather than what other people would have or what God would want. And that is indicative of all of us. And the Bible says that Jesus, the second Adam, came and restored everything that the first Adam messed up. Jesus came and lived a perfect life unlike the first Adam. Jesus, the second Adam, then died as an atoning sacrifice on the cross to give us eternal life. He was raised from the dead to be the first fruits of the resurrection. And now we don't have to fear death anymore. You know, Adam was never intended, he was never meant to die. Neither was Eve. But when they sinned, they brought about their own death. And they ushered death into our universe and into our world. And now Jesus has come and praise his name. He has abolished death. Amen. And we don't have to be afraid of it anymore. And there's going to be a new day. There's going to be a new Jerusalem. There's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. And that's what we are to live for because whether we like it or not, this world is irreparably broken. It will not be fixed. There will not be peace on earth until the Prince of Peace comes back. That doesn't mean that we don't strive. It doesn't mean that we don't act as light and salt. But it does mean that we understand that until Jesus comes, it's not going to be the way we all long for it to be. So today, I want to talk to you out of the book of Daniel following Jesus in an antagonistic environment. How many of you know that this world, I'm talking about the sinful world, is an antagonistic environment when it comes to people who follow Jesus Christ? How many of you know that? You know that in your soul? Sure. Well, Daniel, nobody had more of an antagonistic environment than he did in Babylon. Look there in chapter 1 verses 1 through 7. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. The Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, along with some of the vessels of the house of God. And he brought them to the land of Shinar, to the house of his God. And he brought the vessels into the treasury of his God. Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, the chief of his officials to bring in some of the sons of Israel, including some of the royal family and of the nobles, youths in, which, in whom there was no defect, who were good-looking, showing intelligence in every branch of wisdom, endowed with understanding and discern, discerning knowledge, and who had ability for serving in the king's court. And he ordered him to teach them the literature and language of the Chaldeans. The king appointed for them a daily ration from the king's choice food and from the wine which he drank and appointed that they should be educated three years, at the end of which they were to enter the king's personal service. Now among them were, the, were from the sons of Judah were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. 
Then the commander of the officials assigned new names to them. And to Daniel he assigned the name Belteshazzar, to Hananiah Shadrach, to Mishael Meshach, and to Azariah Abednego. How do you follow Jesus in an antagonistic environment? Daniel lived in a very difficult day for anyone to try to live for the Lord. 150 years before Daniel lived, the Bible says that the wicked pagan nation of the Assyrians came in and destroyed the ten northern tribes of Israel. The Bible says they were carried away. Most of them were slaughtered, but the remnant was carried away into exile, never to come back. 150 years later, in 608 B.C., Daniel and his friends were deported from Judah in the south at Jerusalem. They were deported. The Babylonians under Nebuchadnezzar had come in, and they hadn't destroyed the city yet. They would do that in 587 B.C. But in 608, they started deporting some of the younger men who were very intelligent, Sometimes they would kill their families, and they would take them away. And that's exactly how Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego got to Babylon in 608 B.C. Daniel was in a hostile environment. The Bible says in Daniel 1, 3 through 4, Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, the king of his officials, to bring in some of the sons of Israel, including some of the royal family and of the nobles, Daniel and those other three were part of this. Youths in whom was no defect, who were good-looking, showing intelligence in every branch of wisdom, endowed with understanding and discerning knowledge, and who had the ability for serving in the king's court. And he ordered him to teach them the literature and the language of the Chaldeans. These were Jewish boys. They didn't want to learn the language of pagans. They didn't want to learn paganistic ways and yet they were forced to. They were enslaved. And Daniel would stay there for 60 to 70 years. When he finally died, it wouldn't be the Babylonians who were in charge. It would be the Medo-Persians. He would survive king after king after king, lived to be perhaps in his early 90s before he died. Was probably made a eunuch when he was just a teenager. We know that he never married. And he lived in a culture that had zero respect for his Lord and his Savior. Daniel, nevertheless, stayed faithful to the Lord. Now, why do I bring all this up? Well, you and I live in a culture that is becoming increasingly secular and anti-Jesus Christ. It's going to be hard, not impossible, But you're not going to be able to play around with Christianity much longer. You're going to have to decide whose side you're on. You're going to have to figure out real quick, are you willing to truly serve the Lord with all of your heart? Every concept of righteous, biblical, normalcy, truth is being questioned, attacked. Much of it is being overturned and outlawed. We live in a day when more and more people are okay with homosexual marriage rather than heterosexual monogamous marriage, which is biblical marriage, defined in the second chapter of the Bible, Genesis 2.24, for this cause, marriage, a man shall leave his father and mother and shall cleave to his wife and they shall become one flesh. That's God's standard For marriage always has been, always will be. The only kind of marriage Jesus ever affirmed was that biblical marriage described in Genesis 2.24, heterosexual monogamous marriage. We live in a day, though, that doesn't care about that. We live in a day when a woman's right to have an abortion is more important than a baby's right to life. An unborn baby doesn't have any rights in our nation. That's the kind of nation we're living in. We're living in a day that wants 
increasingly to accept socialism over capitalism. What is socialism at its heart? It's when a small group of elite governmental officials make all the business decisions and really all the other decisions for the people rather than millions of citizens with capitalism making their own financial decisions instead of the government. I'll be frank with you. I am not a socialist. I'm not saying that you have to be a capitalist, but I am one because I believe that the common man deserves to make his own decisions when it comes to his business and to his finances. I am for less government and more people. That's what I'm for. Secularism and atheism are becoming increasingly popular rather than Christian liberty and religious liberty. This idea of globalism, one world system, that's what's driving much of the politics nowadays is that we don't want to just focus on America's economy. We want to to focus on a global economy. Well, it all sounds great until you start realizing that all of a sudden, here at home, we're not really seeing a lot of benefits from this globalism. And I'm not saying we should be selfish, and I'm not saying God is an American. But I want to say this to you. I, I can't get out of my, my soul the patriotism that I have, even from my father who fought in World War II. And I'm not saying that God's an American, but I am. And if I lived in Canada, I'd be praying for that nation. If I lived in Mexico, I'd be praying for that nation. I'm not against any other nation. But I believe the Bible teaches that wherever you are, you ought to pray for the nation you're in to be as godly as God can make it and for God to send revival to the nation that you're in. And I'm not, I'm not, I'm not ashamed to be in America. I, I still say the Pledge of Allegiance. I still softly sing the national anthem. I want to burst it out sometime when I'm at a football game, all right? And maybe I will sometimes scare everybody around me to death, all right? But we live in a day when people say you shouldn't do those things. Well, I've been in a minority for a long time. I'm not worried about all that. And then we live in a day when progressivism, that's a new name for liberalism. We should do that instead of adhere to our Constitution. We live in a day when more and more churches embrace liberal theology, when drunkenness and drug abuse are both rampant, when people live with someone of the opposite gender and they just say, well, we're just living together. It's cohabitation. No, it's fornication. That's what it is. And you shouldn't do it. And if you're in that setting, I'm not mad at you. But you ought to understand that you're committing sexual sin. And, sir, you're the leader. Move out today. Pay for her rent until both of you can get settled. Cohabitation is not something that Christians should do. We live in a day when racism among all ethnicities is rampant. We are divided racially Whites, many of them, I don't, but many of them hate blacks, they hate Latinos, they hate Asians. Many blacks hate whites, they hate Asians, they hate Latinos. Many Latinos hate those other groups and many Asians hate them. There's a lot of hatred going on. And television does not help it. Many of the, 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 much of the antagonism is being fed through our media. And I want to say this to you. It is incumbent upon every Christian and every member of Bellevue Baptist Church to love every other person, regardless of what color your skin is, regardless of what color their skin is. They are somebody that was created in the image of God. They are somebody that Jesus died for, and you don't have the option not to love them and befriend them. We should love everybody everybody all the time. Somebody said, what color is God? I don't know. And you don't either. 
And I don't even think that's a legitimate question. So I won't say anything else about it. But you can't get more polar, polaristic and opposite than the two major political parties in America. And God is not either. God is not a Democrat or a Republican. I, I remember what, you remember when Joshua was standing by the river and they were about to go into the promised land and the angel of the Lord showed up. He said, whose side are you on? Joshua said, whose side are you on? Ours or theirs? He said, neither. I didn't come to take sides. I came to take over. Amen. <laughs> Quit putting God on your side. You, I'm not worried about God being on my side. I want to be on God's side. Amen. I just want to be on God's side. You say, Brother Steve, are you going to start preaching? Sure. <laughs> so I'm holding a baby. I get it. Just pass him down the road. <laughs> You'll get him back. I'll guarantee it. <laughs> All right, here we go. <laughs> If you want to follow Jesus, how many of you, okay, let me just ask, how many of you want to follow Jesus in this antagonistic environment in which we live? All right, all right. There's no simple answers, but here's six good principles from a man who did it. Daniel did it. I don't care about people talking about what they want to do. Oh, I'm going to lose 100 pounds in 2020. How are you going to do it? I don't know. I'm just going to feel my way into it. It ain't going to happen unless you've got a plan, okay? Let me give you a plan, all right? And it's God's plan. It works. It worked for Daniel. It will work for you and me, okay? So quit looking at me and get your pencil out and start writing, all right? Number one, don't pamper your flesh. You said, is there any other way? No. Soon after he arrived in Babylon, Daniel's faith was challenged. Daniel 1, verse 5. I've already read it, but I'll read it again. The king appointed for him, for them, a daily ration from the king's choice food, from the wine which he drank, appointed that they should be educated for three years, at the end of which they were to enter the king's personal service. Nothing he could do about the education, but there was something that he could do about the dietary code. He was a good Jew. He ate kosher food. And there was something in Daniel and his friends that just said, you know what? I'm drawing a line here in the sand. If they kill me, they kill me. But I'm not going to pamper my flesh. I'm not going to have this rich food. I'm not going to get drunk all the time drinking wine. I'm not going to overeat. I'm not going to be a glutton and I'm not going to be a drunkard. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to eat non-Jewish food. I'm going to eat vegetables and drink water primarily, exclusively. Nebuchadnezzar he decreed this. If you didn't follow this, you could die. Might not sound like a big deal to us, but it was a big deal to Daniel. Daniel chapter 1 verse 8, but Daniel made up his mind that he would not defile himself with the king's choice food or with the wine which he drank. So he sought permission from the commander of the officials that he might not defile himself. And he came up with a plan. Look at verse 11 and following. Daniel said to the steward, whom the chief of the eunuchs had assigned over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, test your servants for ten days. Let us be given vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then let our appearance and the appearance of the youths who eat the king's food be observed by you and deal with your servants according to what you see. So he listened to them in this matter. That man literally took his life in his own hands. He listened to the man in this matter, and he tested them for 10 days. At the end of the 10 days, it was seen that they were better in appearance, and I love this, they were fatter. That doesn't mean literally like they had a, a, a belly. Or it means that they were more robust in their look. They, they looked healthier. They were, their eyes were shining in the flesh than all the youths who all ate the king's food. So the steward took away all their food and the wine that they were drinking and gave them vegetables. They refuse to pamper the flesh. Daniel said, I'm not going to eat the way other people eat. God does not want us to be fleshly. I'm talking about selfish. God wants us to allow his Holy Spirit who dwells within us to lead us. The Apostle Paul 
said one of the most amazing things after he said, I have become all things to all men that I may by all means save some. Here's what he said in 1 Corinthians 9, 27. But I discipline my what? Say it out loud. My body. And I make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified. Paul was saying, I'm not going to just let my body go. I know that it's the shell. I know that the spirit and the soul are more important, but my body is the temple of the living God. Paul would write that at the end of 1 Corinthians 6, that his body was the temple of the Holy Spirit. Paul had started well as a Christ follower. He wanted to finish well. How many of you would like to finish well? Anybody out there? I can, I can tell you I want to. So he said, I'm not going to uh, beat myself up or anything like that, but I'm going to discipline my body. I'm going to discipline myself for the purpose of righteousness. I'm going to make sure that I control my body and my fleshly appetites. We've got a girl at this church. Some of you don't know her because she sings a lot of times in the second service. But Colby Chrysler is, in my opinion, a miracle of God. She had double lung transplant. And now, just this last few months, she ran the St. Jude's Marathon. Can you imagine that? Let's just thank God for that. Can we? Amen. Some of us have a hard time walking across the yard. Amen. He said, Brother Steve, this is not the time to talk about this. This is the holidays. I understand. But let me just say this to you. It is God's will for you not to pamper your flesh. It can be in a lot of ways, not just overeating, although that's one of the main ways that happens in America, overeating, overdrinking. And uh, it also is pampering our flesh. You think about only in America would you have a chair named Lazy Boy. <laughs> I mean, come on. Come on. I'm not going to ask you if you have one. All right. But I mean, I mean, you know, come on. I, I mean, that just says itself right there. And a lot of times people, I'll, I'll ask them, how's your prayer life? Well, not too good. And if you dig in, they stay up late watching television. And consequently, they get up late because you have to have some sleep. And then they enter a prayerless day and they walk in defeat because they didn't go to bed on time. They didn't get enough rest and God wants you to rest. Did you know that? God wants you to sleep and get rest. And then they didn't get up on time. They're not disciplined. They're not disciplined for the purpose of godliness. They overeat. Then they have health issues. And yes, we'll pray for you to be healed. But I also want to pray for you to be healthy. And to make the right decisions on the front end. Not an amen in the bunch. <laughs> he said, no, we'll just, want, just, just anoint us with oil after we get sick. Well, what about if you could do something to prevent it and not eat as much? Somebody says, well, how, how can you lose weight? I'll save you a lot of money. Eat less. Eat healthily. Exercise more. You can pay me later, all right? I'm just telling you. It's not rocket science. Are you pampering your flesh? You know, if you walk, 30 minutes a day, you are 50% less likely to have a heart attack. Now, I'm not talking about walking fast, just walking anywhere. 30 minutes a day. Yes, 30 minutes in a row. <laughs> I'll get off of this, but stop pampering your flesh. Number two. If you want to follow Jesus in an antagonistic environment, be like Daniel and cultivate Christian friendships. The Bible says that Daniel 
interpreted a dream of Nebuchadnezzar, and Nebuchadnezzar elevated him to one of the highest positions in the nation. Daniel 2, 48, Daniel, the king promoted Daniel and gave him many gifts. He made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon and the chief prefect over all the wise men of Babylon. And then what happened was this. He turned around and blessed his friends. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Daniel 2, 49. And Daniel made request to the king and appointed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the administration of the province of Babylon while Daniel was at the king's court. Daniel had this magnanimous spirit. He didn't want just to prosper himself. He wanted his friends to prosper. He wanted to have godly, godly friends. I want to ask you, are you cultivating godly friends? You don't have to have a lot of friends, but you should have a few close friends, all of whom who love the Lord Jesus Christ. It's okay to befriend lost people if you're trying to lead them to Christ. But I want to say this to you, you have to be careful. The Bible says in Proverbs 13, 20, walk with the wise and become wise. Associate with fools and you're going to get in trouble. Ask anybody who has messed up in their lives, made bad decisions, and almost to the person you'll find out much of it was because of the people they were running around with. One of the hardest things to do as a parent is to monitor who your children are with. You cannot, parents, I don't care what they say, you cannot just let your children go and be with anybody they want to be with. You've got to help make the, you, you, say, you say, well, they tell me if I do that, I don't trust them. Look at me. If they ask you, mom, don't you trust me? Say no. <laughs> and then say, I don't trust myself, much less you or anybody else. We've got to have close godly friends. We've got to. That doesn't mean that we don't befriend anybody that doesn't love the Lord. But the main reason we do that is to win them to faith in Jesus Christ. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15, 33, don't be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. Proverbs 27, 17, though, says iron sharpens iron. So one man can sharpen another. If you want to be a better Christian, cultivate Christian friendships. Very quickly, number three, if you want to follow Jesus in an antagonistic environment, be like Daniel and don't love worldly things. In chapter 5 of Daniel, the king, Belteshazzar, grandson of Nebuchadnezzar, committed a great sin. He took all of the valuable religious utensils that were used in the Jewish temple to worship God and he started using them at a pagan party with a thousand people and he started drinking and getting drunk with the vessels that were used to worship God. And a hand appeared and wrote on the wall, Mani, Mani, Tekel, Uparson. Nobody could interpret it except Daniel. And when Daniel came in, Here's what the king said to him in Daniel 5, 16. I personally have heard about you that you're able to give interpretations and solve difficult problems. Now, if you're able to read the inscription and make its interpretation known to me, you will be clothed with purple. You'll wear a necklace of gold around your neck and you'll have authority as the third ruler in the kingdom. And notice how Daniel responded to these lucrative gifts. Daniel 5, 17. Daniel answered and said to the king, keep your gifts for yourself or give your reward to somebody else. However, I will read the inscription to the king and make the interpretation known to him. And he looked him right in the eye and said, you have been weighed in the balance and you have been found wanting and you're going down. And that night he died and the Babylonian empire was over and the Medo-Persians took over and Daniel didn't want a thing, didn't want a thing thing from that sinful man. 
What about you? Do you love worldly things? The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 6, 17, therefore come out from among unbelievers, separate yourself from them, says the Lord. Don't touch their filthy things. There are some things in this world that are filthy, like pornography and other things, and I will welcome you. 1 John 2 says, don't love the world nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. You should love people and use things, and you should not love things and use people. If you want to follow Jesus in antagonistic environments, Be like Daniel, don't love worldly things. Number four, if you want to follow Jesus in an antagonistic environment, make prayer your priority. When the Medo-Persians defeated the Babylonians, Daniel continued to serve the new king, and he was placed as one of the highest leaders over Medo-Persia. And the other leaders around him under the king didn't like that, and they wanted to get this Jewish man out of the way. So they made a law, and the didn't tell the king what it was about and they said make a law that nobody can pray to anybody except for you for a month because they knew Daniel would not stop praying and the Bible says when Daniel heard that the law that prayer had been outlawed he kept right on praying Daniel 6 10 now when Daniel knew that the document was signed he entered his house now in his roof chamber he had windows open toward Jerusalem he continued kneeling on his knees three times a day praying and giving thanks before his God and he had as he had done previously they went and they told the king the king loved Daniel he didn't want to do it but he had to throw him in the lion's den and you know what happened the Bible says apparently that the the lion of Judah showed up because an angel showed up and just went over to those lions how many of you know that one angel can stop a lot of lions amen angel showed up down in that den and said sit down and they all just sat down And Daniel, the next morning when the king ran toward his chamber, his jail cell, and where the pit was, he said, Daniel, was your God able to save you? Daniel said, after he said, O king, may you live forever, Daniel 6, 22, my God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouths, and they have not harmed me inasmuch as I have been found innocent before him, and also toward you, O king, I have committed no I want to ask you, are you that committed to prayer? Would you be arrested and thrown into the lion's den if somebody told you you couldn't pray anymore? I want to say this to you. Real Christians spend time with God in prayer. And real churches are houses of prayer. Jesus said, my house shall be called a house of prayer. If Bellevue is not a house of prayer, then this church does not belong to God because God's house belongs is a house of prayer that's the kind of house that belongs to God is your body a house of prayer is your home a house of prayer do you pray and I'm not just talking about a little bit on the way to work God give me a good day don't let me have a car wreck and bless me financially that's not much that's not going to cut it in the days to come in this next year commit yourself to prayer i've got a little book i'll give you a copy if you can't afford one i'm not trying to sell any books don't care anything about that i'm I'm, i I promise before the lord jesus christ but i can't download everything i could tell you about prayer right now but i do have a little book called pray like it matters and i believe that things are different once you pray than they were before you prayed i think that after you pray things are different than they were before you prayed. And I want to ask you to let this year be the year that you really grab hold of prayer. If you don't like my book, go get somebody else's book. But learn how to pray. Learn how to talk with God, and things will be different. Some of you have burdens that you're carrying, and you talk to other people about them, but you don't talk to God about them. I want to say this to you. Nothing wrong with talking to other people, but you need to talk to God about your situation way more than you talk to other people about your situation. God can fix anything, but you've got to pray. I could stay all day right on that. Make prayer your priority. Number five, if you want to follow Jesus in an antagonistic environment, be like Daniel and pray scripture and fast. 
Daniel was one of the greatest prayer warriors ever to live. There were times when his prayers were so intense, he added the biblical discipline of fasting. The Bible says that he was reading in the book of Jeremiah, and he discovered that the, the Jews were supposed to stay in Babylon for 70 years. He knew that that time was running out, so he starts praying the promise that they'll get to go back home. And he started fasting. Daniel chapter 9, verses 1 through 3, in the first year of Darius, that's a Medo-Persian, the son of Ahasuerus of Median descent, who was made king over the kingdom of the Chaldeans. In the first year of the reign, I, Daniel, observed in the books of the number of the years which was revealed as the word of the Lord to Jeremiah the prophet for completion of the desolations of Jerusalem, namely 70 years. In other words, they were going to be in Babylonian captivity, Medo-Persian captivity for 70 years. So I gave my attention to the Lord God to seek Him by prayer and supplication with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. He took that promise and he started fasting. He added fasting to his prayers and he started praying the promises of God. And guess what? He wouldn't go back, but a whole bunch of people, Nehemiah, Ezra, all those people went back, and they rebuilt the temple. And I believe they built it. I believe the foundation of that were the prayers of the prophet Daniel. I want to encourage all of you to fast, not just to pray, but to fast. You say, Brother Steve, I can't. I take medicine. Look at me. I take medicine. You can eat a little something in the morning when you take your medicine. And you can do without certain foods. Some of you know more medicine than you take. You could do without food. You say, do without a whole meal? Look at me. Yeah. It's okay. Now, if you, if you, you have to have something like if you're a diabetic, you've got to have certain things. Follow that. But look, you can do without certain foods. Fast from food. What is fasting? It's doing without food and using the time that you would be eating in reading the Bible and praying. That's all it is. And fasting, I don't know what to tell you, fasting throws your prayers into another gear. When you fast, all I can tell you, it's like you're under this protective bubble. It's, it's like God just has you. He already has you, but it's like you sense it. You feel it. You know that God is moving. And God moves. Some of you have situations in your life that you prayed about, prayed about, prayed about, and you don't see any budging whatsoever, look at me, more than likely, I'm not your Holy Spirit, but it, more than likely it's time to add fasting and praying the promises of God. And I want to say this to you, it is for today. Write this down in your memory. I want us to fast next year 12 times on 12 days. On the third of every month, the third is a great number when it comes to the Trinity, amen? So that means next Friday we start. You said no food? I would encourage you, no food. As little as possible. Or if you want to cut out some food, you say, I'll cut out the vegetables. No, don't do that. (laughs) Cut out the meat. Cut out something that you dearly like and get by with just as little as possible for 24 hours. And when, instead, of, instead of eating, read the Word and pray. I promise you it will change your life. Let's do it every third of every month, the third of every month, whatever day that is, doesn't really matter. And let's pray for God to send revival And let's pray Scripture back to God. Again, if you don't know how to do that, again, I promise you, the Lord knows my heart. I am not trying to push my book. And I'm telling you, I will give you a copy. If you can't afford to pay it, you go over to that bookstore and you say, I can't afford it. I need it. Look, I'll pay for it myself. It doesn't matter. But I've got a whole thing on fasting in there, a whole chapter on it. But whether you get that book or not, doesn't matter. Just do what God says do. Some of you will never see the miracle that God is wanting to do in your life, the victory that God is wanting to give you until you start fasting and praying Scripture. Last thing is this, and I'm setting up all next year with this next point. If you want to follow Jesus 
in an antagonistic environment, be like Daniel and be assured that a better day is coming. Amen? Aren't you glad of that? The Lord loved Daniel, loved his commitment to prayer. And I want to say this to you now. Some of you may not like this. Some of you may not even want to believe what I'm about to say. Look at me. God talks to people that pray and fast and tells them things that he won't tell people that don't. God talks to people that pray and fast and he tells them things that he won't tell his other children that don't do those things. Now you can get mad at me. You can deny what I just said. All I know is I know that what I just said is truth before God. And I don't know about you, but I've heard enough people. I want to hear God. Amen. I'm tired of hearing all these people. Everybody's got an opinion nowadays. Everybody's got a platform. And about 90% of it's not worth listening to. Amen. I want to hear from God. In these difficult days, I want to hear from God. And so, one of the things that you'll get when you fast and you pray is this peace. That you know what? Regardless of what comes my way on this earth, there's a better day coming. There's a better day coming. Daniel was told about the end of time. He was told that a better day is coming. Look at Daniel chapter 12, and then we'll be through. Verse 1, now at that time, Michael, that's one of the greatest angels in the whole, all of heaven, the great prince who stands guard over the sons of your people. He is over Israel. You mess with Israel, you mess with the angel Michael, and look at me, that doesn't work out real well. The great prince will arise. He, he, Michael is saying this, and the great prince is talking about Jesus, the second coming of Jesus, and you can read about that in Revelation 19. There will be a time of distress such as never occurred since there was a nation until that time. That's the great tribulation. And at that time, your people, everyone who is found written in the book will be rescued. Many of those who sleep in the dust of the ground will awake, these to everlasting life, others to disgrace and everlasting contempt. That's the final judgment, Revelation 20. Those who have insight will shine brightly like the brightness of the expanse of heaven. Those who lead the many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. That's the new Jerusalem, Revelation 21 and 22. But as for you, Daniel, conceal these words, seal up the book until the end of time. Many will go back and forth and knowledge will increase. Look at me. I don't know when. I don't know all that's going to happen. I love what Dr. Rogers used to say. He said, when it comes to the second coming of Christ, he said, I'm not on the planning committee. I'm on the welcoming committee. He said, I don't know how it's all going to happen, but I'm just going to look forward to it. And I want to say this to you. One of the greatest comforts and joy in my heart is to know that even though this world is broken and it will not fix itself, Jesus is coming back and he will fix this world. Amen? Let's thank him for that right now. <laughs> Starting next Sunday morning, after we have all fasted on Friday, on Sunday morning, I'll be preaching from Revelation chapter 1 beginning at verse 1. We're going to walk through the whole book. And it tells us that a better day is coming. Now, if it's physically possible for you, if you can't do it, I understand. But I want you to get down on your knees, and I want us to dedicate 2020 to the Lord Jesus Christ, all right? If you can't do that, just close your eyes. That's fine. But if it's physically possible, get down on your knees, and you just pray right now. And I'll lead us in a word of prayer momentarily and say, God, I'm living in a day that is hostile and antagonistic toward Jesus. Help me in these days. Just pray back through those, those six things that I gave you.
Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that a day is like a thousand years with you and a thousand years is like a day. We don't know when you will come, but you told us to be watching and waiting. And Lord, truth be told, our hearts are longing for you because we increasingly see that as Christians, this world offers no hope. But you are this world's hope and you're our hope. So today we ask you to help us to be like Daniel, who himself had victory over an antagonistic environment. Help us never to pamper, to pamper our flesh. Dear God, help us not to be drunkards or gluttons. Help us not to be lazy. Help us not to be slothful. Help us like Paul to discipline our bodies that we might not be a castaway. Help us to cultivate Christian friendships. God, help us to have good, godly friends that pray for us and pray with us and walk with us and encourage us in the things of God. Help us, Lord God, not to be friend of a lost person except for one person purpose, and that is to lead them to faith in Christ. Help us not to love worldly things. Help us to love people and to use things instead of loving things and using people. And Lord, help us to make prayer our priority. And help us not only to pray, but to pray Scripture. And help us to fast, Lord God. I pray that the third day of every month would be a high and holy day in our hearts. That, Lord, we wouldn't go around boasting about it. You tell us not to but that we would find that extra time when we normally eat and we would spend time in prayer and Bible reading. <clears throat> and Lord, help us above all to have the calming confidence that Jesus is coming back and a better day is coming. The lamb will lie down with the lion. The little boy will tread at the cobra's door. And Lord God, we thank you that we will beat our weapons into plowshares and study war no more. Oh, Jesus, thank you that you're coming back. Every eye will see you. Every knee shall bow. Every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ, not Muhammad, not Buddha, but Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Thank you, Lord. For letting us study briefly the life of Daniel. Thank you for his love for you. May we be like him because he was like Jesus. And Lord, we dedicate 2020 to you. We dedicate the year. We dedicate the decade. Some of us will be in heaven before this ne next decade is over. To God be the glory. Jesus might come back before this ne next decade is over. Praise you, Lord. Lord, we have no idea what's going to happen politically even this year. But we just give it all to you, and we're going to trust you no matter what happens. We will exult in the Lord. We will rejoice in the God of our salvation. And we bless you and praise you. We will not be divided. We will not become racially divided. We will not be divided in any way, dear God. We will stand firm. And love you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. We offer ourselves to you right now. Just lift up your hand right now and just offer yourself right now. We offer ourselves to you right now, Lord, as living and holy sacrifices. Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done in our lives on earth as it is in heaven. All for the glory of Jesus. Do exceeding abundantly this year beyond all that we can ask or think. Save a lot of people baptize a lot of people, fill a lot of people with the Holy Spirit, and let a lot of people grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus. And let the name of Jesus be glorified in our lives, in our churches, in our city, in our state, in our nation, and in this world. Let the name of Jesus be glorified. In His name we pray, and all God's people said, Amen. Let's all stand up. Thank the Lord for what He's going to do in 2020. Let's thank Him right now by faith and ask Him.
praise Him, love Him.